great American leader of our time, one who serves our country today as he has in the past, the 37th President of the United States, the Honorable Richard Nixon. Mr. President and members and guests of the Chicago Economic Club, after that very gracious introduction and after learning that this is the largest crowd this club has had in its 61-year history, I have an announcement to make. I've been wondering what I could run for. <laughs> I can't run for president again because I've already been elected twice and I'm barred by the 22nd Amendment. Uh, we have a very good governor in New Jersey. I don't want to run there where I live. Our mayor in Saddle River is just fine, too. But I think what I could do is to move to Chicago and run for president of the Economic Club of Chicago. <laughs> in talking to your president and also to others here at the head table, I've learned that the question that most of you would probably like for me to discuss tonight is who will be the next president of the United States. Uh, in the question period, I'll be glad to take questions on that or other subjects of whatever you may be interested in. But at the present time, I think it would be well if we could put these events in historical perspective. And consequently, I would like to do that here tonight in my opening remarks. In just 12 years, maybe in this very beautiful room, many of you will be celebrating a day that comes once in a thousand years. It'll be the beginning of a new year, the beginning of a new century, and a beginning of a new millennium. On such a day, this will be the first time in history at the beginning of a century that man will have the capability for unlimited destruction or unlimited progress. Winston Churchill addressed this subject in his Iron Curtain speech, which he gave just seven months after the atomic bomb was first exploded. Listen to his words. An iron curtain is drawn down over their front, and we do not know what lies behind it. It is vital that we make some kind of a settlement with the Soviets now, rather than waiting until our armies are mortally weakened and we withdraw to our zones of occupation. That advice of Churchill's was not taken, and an historic opportunity to make an arrangement or a deal with the Soviet Union, which would have made us had a freer and safer world today, was lost. We have a similar historic opportunity today. The question is, what has changed since that statement was made? When he made that statement 42 years ago, there were only nine atom bombs in the world. The United States had all of them. Today, there are over 50,000 nuclear warheads in the world, and the Soviet Union has almost half of them. We are in a race tonight, a race between total destruction and unparalleled progress. And the question as to how that race comes out will be determined in large part by whether the United States provides enlightened leadership for the free world. Can we provide that leadership? Well, certainly we have the ability to do so. We are the strongest and richest country in the world. Unemployment is down. Taxes are down. Inflation is down. We're at peace. Most Americans have never had it so good. And yet, we find a wave of isolationism sweeping over this country. A new negativism seems to pervade our public discourse. Pundits and politicians in a new best-selling book proclaim that the United States is in decline, that we're over the hill, that we can no longer assume the burdens of the leadership of the free world. The scenario goes something like this. A nation's military power depends upon the strength of its economy. When a nation's foreign commitments exceed the capabilities of its economy, 
its economy is weakened, and it enters a period of decline. This has happened to both the Soviet Union and the United States. Consequently today, the major threat we face in the world is not the military power of the Soviet Union, but the economic power of Japan. And consequently, we should therefore reduce our foreign commitment so that we can meet this new threat. Japan is a challenge to the United States. It is not a threat. The Soviet Union is a threat. For 70 years, the Soviet Union has demonstrated that it is possible to be powerful militarily despite having a weak economy. And Japan today is an economic giant and a military midget. It is a question of choice. We are not prisoners of the past. We can determine our future. Robert Thompson, the British historian and strategist, had a classic formula. It went something like this. National power equals resources plus people times will. Now, there's no question that the Soviet Union has the will to play a role on the world scene. The question is whether the United States has the will to do so. Now, we'll have to admit that we weren't as dominant today as we were 40 years ago when the nations of Europe and Japan were prostrate because of World War II. And yet at the present time, with only 5% of the world's people, we still produce over 25% of the world's goods. As Herb Stein has pointed out, the United States is a very rich country. We're not rich enough to do everything, but we are rich enough to do everything important. And certainly, to continue to provide the resources necessary to lead the free world is not only important, it is indispensable to our survival. If we are to do so, it is going to be necessary, however, for us to deal with some very serious problems. The federal def deficit is a time bomb which could destroy the splendid Reagan economic legacy if it is not diffused. And it is necessary for us to be selective in our foreign commitments. As Frederick the First, or the Great pointed out, a nation must always be concerned that if it tries to defend everywhere, it defends nothing. And it is essential that our allies in Europe and Japan pay their fair share of defending the free world. But even assuming that we can do this, is it possible for us to match the will of the Soviet Union? Well, will without leadership is impotent. And in Mikhail Gorbachev, the Soviet Union has a leader, a very strong leader, who has within his own hands the power to match and to carry out his will. And so tonight, I would suggest that we take a close look at this remarkable man, Time Magazine's Man of the Year in 1987. Who is he? What does he believe? And what should our reaction be to him? I have known three general secretaries of the Soviet Union, Khrushchev in 1959 and 60, Brezhnev in 1972, 73, and 74, and Gorbachev in 1986. He is the ablest of the three. He is very well educated. He earned a bachelor's degree in law. He was born with a master's degree in public relations. <laughs> he is a man who has enormous self-confidence. Unlike his predecessors, he is so sure of his strength that he's not afraid to talk about his weaknesses. He has a temper but he uses it. He seldom loses it. Gorbachev is a world-class heavyweight. I would put him in the league with the great leaders of the post-World War II period, Churchill, Adenauer, de Gaulle, de Gasperi, Yoshida, MacArthur, Eisenhower, Zhou Enlai. And the major test of who should be the next president of the United States is can he get in the ring with Gorbachev. 
Gorbachev.